Joe's the little prince, I'm the host here. And uh, <laughs> I, I should point out that when I, when I was very young, I went to an event like this in which Sam Hunter interviewed Milton Resnick, uh, who were probably at that time about as old as Joe and I are. And as a young person, I remember walking out of that event thinking that Sam Hunter was a pretentious asshole and that, that uh, Milton Resnick was completely crazy. So <laughs> if, you, if you come out of that with some sense, similar sense, I will perfectly understand. Will understand. <laughs> yes, exactly. So I, um, well, I was thinking about this conversation and I had sort of prepared myself to talk about sort of the Heideggerian concept of living into the world, and I talked to Joe, and he said he wanted to talk about Oklahoma. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, I'm perfectly all right with that. Although I, I would like to ask uh, Joseph to begin by uh, explaining how he made these things. <laughs> oh well, I, I, to tell I, the secrets of your practice. Yeah, I just oil and water. I, oh. did, uh, I, I, I just put layer on top of layer of paint and then I throw a bunch of water on it and I put another layer on it. I just keep building it up <clears throat> until it reaches the point no return. So you, you put down an oil gram and you what, spray the water on it? Sometimes or just throw it on sometimes. So it depends. Yeah. And th this is... And what so happens, the water dries, the, I mean the, the, the paint dries quicker with the oil not, you know, when, the, when it just has the linseed oil, that dries quicker, but when it has water on it, it dries, that part dries slower. Right. So therefore, it picks, it, it, does, it picks up the layer underneath, but the paint on, that doesn't have any water on it, you know, right, right. just, just uh, has the last color. Well, I, this, this brings up the issue is that uh, having moved back to water from using a shotgun, basically the same way. <laughs> yes. um, <laughs> Does, does this mean that you're like mellowing out? <laughs> no, it just means I live in a restricted area. <laughs> yeah. But sort of the idea of imposing sort of extraneous materials on, on the paintings is, is a sort of continuous. To me, it's basically, you know, it, it, it's kind of a, it's kind of the idea of, of building something up, up and, dis and then destroying it, and then building it up again and destroying it and, and until finally, you know, it it becomes something I haven't seen, and that's that's what I'm looking for, something I haven't seen. So does this go back to Pollock? He used to talk about making a good painting at every stage of his paintings and then destroying it with the next color. Yeah, you know, maybe. It, I think it does have, you know, it, it's somewhat uh, that, that's somewhat kind of like what I do, but. No. I never said I was nature. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> Although these do have a lot to do with nature. Yeah. Uh, and uh, as Joe and I know, and you it probably has a lot to do with nature in Oklahoma, yeah. which tends to be relatively uninflected. Um, is this... Uh, we're asking me when we... Uh, when we were talking on the phone, said so you wanted to talk about Texas and Oklahoma, uh, they're not that far apart. Uh, Texas, of course, is much more culturally advanced. <laughs> <laughs> That's because all the cultural people from Oklahoma left. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and aside from you and Boucher, who else left? Right. But um, uh, what, what's your debt to Oklahoma, do you think? And, not in your painting, just in your life as an artist. What is my your debt to Oklahoma? Oh well, um, actually, you know, my real debt to Oklahoma is like the influence that I got from my father, after, who was a portrait painter. Right. And uh, you know, that was, I mean, that was considerable. I mean, basically, you know, I learned how, you know, I learned a way of seeing, you know, through my father's showing me that I, I use to this day. And I mean, he he actually taught me this by I, he, every Sunday he would take us take take my, he and I would go to this lake and we would draw this log and we we drew this log I knew when I was only about nine years old and I drew this log every Sunday the way I you know, approached my work. So then, the, the, when you when you became an artist, and a whole sort of rhetoric of 
process became fashionable, you, you felt at home, I presume. I did, yeah. Um, I did. I thought, you know, I've always felt that, you know, well, first of all, I've, I've, I've kind of always felt like, you, you know, you can use any materials to make art. I've never, I've, I've never felt uh, any restriction in that regard. But, uh, um. So, actually, actually, I have two questions. First of all, I just realized uh, when we, I came in here today that uh, I've been hanging out in this neighborhood for many, many years. I was in a B'nai B'rith Boy Scout troop that used to be right down here. Uh, I was the only Gentile in the group, and they called me Tex. <laughs> but I have been to a, uh, and also I was the only, as far as I knew, the only child in California that didn't have a bar mitzvah. But uh, <laughs> at the uh, at the same time, you know, as Joe and I, I'm sure, have been looking at art in this neighborhood for many years. Uh, and as a consequence, the idea of standing around here in front of these pictures talking about them seems vaguely obscene. Um, and, and in other words, if, if anybody's art says, you know, shut up, dork, um, <laughs> uh, to a certain extent, uh, um, chose to. And uh, I mean, how do you feel about talking about this work? I mean, well, I, I, I don't feel that there's very much to, you know, to me, what someone sees in any painting is, is just what somebody sees. And what, like what an artist tries to do uh, or to convey in, in work, a lot of times is completely different. So, you know, I feel it. I feel it's just a time to get to know people. I don't. I don't feel like you really, you know. I, I, I don't have any. I don't have any knowledge to impart about, you know, how, how what my paintings are about or anything. I just don't. You know, I, I think everybody who sees them sees them in a different way, and I think that's as it should be. But what I intend, what I intend, or what I try to do, or what I try to get out of my paintings myself is a different story. But that's as. I am in my studio as an artist, and not as a part of the audience. And then when I come here tonight, I, like the rest of you, I'm just part of the audience. So uh, I'm just looking at it just like you do, and everybody probably has a different idea of what they think about it. Right. You, you share that with your friend, Ruche. I, I always distinguish, uh, I visit a lot of artist studios, and you can always divide artists by where they stand when you look at their work because there's a whole groups of artists who go stand by the work, and then there's another whole group of artists, like Joseph and Edward, who come and stand by you and stand there and sort of scratch their head too and say, <laughs> oh, wow, <laughs> what's that? <laughs> We're hard to pin down. <laughs> <laughs> but there is, a, you mentioned when we were talking on the phone that you thought you might want to talk about the sort of problematic relationship between uh, Criticism and art. Uh, what, what did, what did, how does it look from your side? Well, it looked, it, it looks like a conflict because basically the interest of a critic is, is, is like not necessarily the interest of an artist. So it looks, it looks on the surface like a conflict. But you know, it to me the the, the more the better a critic can write the less conflict there is. And I'm really convinced of that. But like when 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 a, when I see something that's written about mine or anybody else's work and that you know, a person I know and they write things that are factually untrue, it's it's very difficult to deal with. It, to me that's just another form of expression. And therefore it's not reliable for information for me. But uh, on the other hand, when somebody is really perceptive and they have their own thoughts about it, and it's completely different from mine. If it's factually, basically factually correct, and they have their own opinion, they have, and it's completely different from mine. I really like it because basically, if they have, if they're consistent in what they say about what they look at, I think I think everybody, and including art, can really they can really learn a lot from. It. So to me, that's where they're really constructive. Well, do you feel like, sir? I know that that early in your career, you were sort of. Uh, and it's like many of your contemporaries sort of 
draped with the veil of being a West Coast pop artist. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you feel like this was a problem or not? I mean, do you think? Uh, no, you know what? It, you know, it wasn't a problem. It was inaccurate, but it wasn't a problem. And the reason it wasn't a problem because I, like at a, at a very early point, uh, was able to show my work, and so I didn't care what they called it. I understand. <laughs> well, now that I've got you here, what about those milk bottles? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think I think they're the I think they're it's the earliest body of work I ever did. And I think they're the worst painted body of work I ever did. But what about the milk bottles? <laughs> <laughs> they occasionally break. <laughs> I mean, what were they there for? Yeah, you know, was, you know. <laughs> they're just there to occupy space. <laughs> you know, a sort of a formless. They were, yeah, actually. Actually, I, in some of the milk bottle paintings I did, I actually drew lines of perspective you know, that came out of the painting, just like where this painting was, to show that they actually were, you know, somehow situated in the painting. But it was, it was pretty primitive. How long did you, uh, I, I noticed, what is it recently, is your last show here, you're still using objects in the, in the room, you're using you know, uh, stairways and things like right. that. Uh -huh. uh, do you have any sort of general, Ideology for doing that. I mean, usually when artists do what I mean, when artists do this sort of thing, they're less interested in making people see something as in keeping people from thinking something else. No, I, I, I did that specific. When I, I, the, I did that was the third series of work that I had done with staircases. Right. The first series I did, they came straight out of the wall for the most part. And then the second series I did, they parallel the wall. And then this series, I combined them with painting. And what I was originally intrigued with at the time I did these staircases the first time was the idea of how it, it's the same thing that, like, it, it's a way I look at painting where you, you, you look into a painting and the stairs go in and out, and they go up and down. Right. And so this idea of going in and out the space and going up and down was what really intrigued me about it. So you, you wanted a kind of... It was just a visual. Just a visual incarnation of the way you... It's like instructions for looking at the painting? Well, for me, it was, yeah, it was instructions Oops. for me looking at painting, yeah. Well, how... That is... Do, do you, you regard yourself as a, uh, as a landscape painter? Um... Mm. Well, I'm just a pop artist. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just finished writing a little piece about Ruskin and Turner, and so after looking at a lot of Turners and walking in here, I don't feel totally disoriented. Mm -hmm. uh, except, of course, that these are much more farm paintings. Uh, that, that is, uh, could you could you paint these in the East Coast? Could I don't you? think so. I don't think so. So why not? I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not being, I'm asking because I'm interested. Uh, well, because th these paintings have to do with wide open spaces. I mean, they, you know, I don't think you can see these paintings on the East Coast. Uh, I mean, I don't think I can see what I see in the landscape on the East Coast like I, like what I see here. Yeah. So, as a painter, then, I mean, well, I, I'll just ask you this: as an artist, uh, artists tend to sort of imagine their homies or people that they identify with. So. Do you have a sort of uh, imaginary fraternity of painters or a fraternity of artists with whom you with whom you feel at home? You mean like in a timeless sense, or do you mean yeah, like, yeah, just in general? Well, yeah, I, there's there's certain painters that like I have uh, yeah, a, a, a really a tremendous amount of respect for and, and, and get a lot of information from, uh, but it depends on you know it depends on what I'm doing at the time. Uh, which one of these? I mean, for instance, like probably the strongest, the strongest artist that ever influenced me was Marcel Duchamp, but he's hardly any influence at all now. Right. So, um, you know, at the time, at the time, I was really influenced by. I mean, this was like 40 years ago, and I was really, I was really interested in, much like any any other youth in rebellion, the idea of tearing everything down. And right. for me, Marcel Duchamp epitomized that. Uh, in art, so uh, then I started. I started like thinking more in terms of trying to develop 
a, a way that I could show the way I see. And that, that took on a different connotation. That, that took on a connotation of trying to build something. And to me, it's much more difficult. So, so who was your main historical mentor, say, after Deshaun? Do you, do you have anyone? Well, people like, uh, after, well, I, Bob Earl was one. I mean, but, but that was it. I mean, I mean, I knew him, so he was my teacher. Right. So, I mean, he definitely was. Have you, uh, and it was in the area of like his idea of perception. It was the idea. Of, it was the idea of, of the, you know what he was involved with is a way of seeing, and that's that's what I shared with him is a way of seeing. You know that part. That was, that was what was important to him in in developing his you know his work, and he imparted that to his students. And wow. even today, I feel that's important. How do you know when these are finished? Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, how do you know that you need to start too? But actually, how do you know that when they are finished? Is I, you know, I don't think there's a way of really knowing. Like, you know, I've done so many things that I've gotten back to. I just finished a painting right now. That part of it I started ten years ago, and I, I get I reach a certain point, and I just thought, oh man, I don't I, I don't even want to look at this, and I put it in storage, and then I bring it out. And then I start working on it again, and then sometimes I, I'll put another, uh, maybe I'll make a diptych out of it or something, or maybe put a milk bottle with it, or, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I'm not hearing all these words. And you having the milk bottle thing sort of cornered just gives you a real advantage over other painters. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> How, but, but really, do you just paint on them until they look okay? Yeah, I just paint on them until I see. I, I tell you, I paint on them until they look. They look like I haven't like one half of something I haven't seen. You know? Right. Well, one of the peculiar, most interesting things about your pictures, and I think one of the things that sort of locates them in their moment, is that uh, they really look strange with paintings by other artists. In other words, there, there, there is a kind of I guess Duchampian kind of facticity to the pictures. Uh, do you experience that when you see them, so like in a group show or something? Sometimes, yeah, sometimes. So, so what is it that you're doing or not doing that everyone else is doing or not doing? Well, I think what I think essentially a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times, I do something matter that is very, uh, very conducive to a kind of seductive image, and I always try to somehow like. Like bring something in it that like makes it kind of uh, destroyed or something uh, to agitate it some way or something like that. You mean by subject matter? You mean the clouds or skies or clouds yeah, or skies, right. fires or you know? So how ideological is this stuff? I mean, you can I can sort of do a sort of green reading of these if I wish to. I mean, you talk about you know. The pollution of nature and, mm -hmm. and the really great colors that pollution makes, right. um, and uh, sort of raise an issue of the whole problematic of painting and nature. Uh, is this is this something you're thinking yeah, about? Yeah, these are things that I think about. I do. Yeah, I had I had a show first time. I had a show one time in London of uh, cloud paintings that I did, and they were paintings that I I, I painted one layer. Uh, and then I let it dry, and then I painted, I, I, I put another layer on top of it, and I cut it out, cut out the top layer. And I had a show of these in London, and, I, you know, I was really amazed that when I, uh, people, people would come up to me in my opening, and nobody recognized them as sky, because they had small color, they had all this pea green or these baby colors and all this stuff, there, and they didn't recognize it as the sky. And to be, living in Los Angeles, it was just such a common, it was such a common sky. Right, and so that they were just totally unaware of sort of sky stuff. Uh -huh. right. right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, have you ever, ever, I know you've done waterfall paintings that are totally cropped and mm -hmm. these. Uh, what would happen if these actually had any sort of pictorial inference? I mean, if you had a horizon line or something like that, they won't work. No, they? they won't work at all. I mean, to me, the, the, my, all my paintings always have been details. They're just details of whatever I'm painting. Of, of, of larger processes. Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, 
even though they sort of engage these, these issues of, you know, environmental issues and things like that, um, do you regard them as making statements about them? No, that's where, that's where I fall into the audience category. That, you know, I, uh, I don't regard them as making statements. <laughs> but, uh, but in, in other words, these, these can be taken sort of as the positive consequences of pollution. No, I think it's neutral. Uh, you're, you're, it's a neutral stance. I mean, I don't, I don't consider these paintings to be positive or negative uh, at all regarding. Uh, uh, so you are sort of like nature, right? <laughs> 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 Well, when you, that is, did, well, these pictures, I'm, just, I'm interested in the sequences. They were thick, now they're thin. Uh, is, is, is that because they wouldn't take your check at the paint store or, or you know, <laughs> like the like Ann says? That I contributes to I mean, is there a logic to the development or is it Well, I, I do it because basically I, I just tried to find a way that I could put layer on top of layer where, because like using it that way, you can get more depth. And it's a lot, it's a lot of, you know, like, by just putting thin layers on, then you can uh, use it, like thick and pasta. Well, did, you, did your dad teach you to do, like, traditional oil glazing and things like that when you were a kid? No. I what, what kind of paintings? Did, did he use oil? Yeah, he did. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah, uh, he did, like, very, you know, he, he would use palette knife and, you know, you know, the traditional kind of techniques of, you know, using brush and palette knife. And stuff. Right. Well, that is... You are like a, like a, a great many artists of your generation. I mean, you can be. I mean, these are uh, these are sort of pull a change things. I mean, they change, but they don't change. Uh, uh, in other words, there's there's a real sort of coherence from first to last in what you do. How do they look different now to you? I mean, uh, uh, the question I think really is how has the world changed around you? Do you have do you have any sense of that? No, they don't, I mean, I don't, I just, they didn't give a, the, I mean, the painting, the paintings look different now because I, I do them differently, so. Uh, do you think you're better? I, uh, better than those milk paintings, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> those incredibly valuable milk bottle paintings, that are a much, much more superior thing. Uh, <laughs> is the, the evolution of these spaces, which is again very term um, uh, and the evolution of the, the sort of palettes here, uh, is this a progressive decision? I mean, do you have an idea of what you want the, the painting to look like when you start? No, I really don't. That's, that's the one thing that's like, I, I, I really don't. I just, I, and that's why I, ne I never know how long it's going to take. I never know when they're finished. And sometimes I think, uh, you know, I, I look at something for a couple of months and I just think I don't like it at all, and so I make something else out of it. And, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm really ambiguous that way because. Uh, Are there any? Like, if I could figure out a way of making it, if I could, if I had a painting that I've had for sitting around for a while, and I think I can like bring something out in it that I haven't seen or something in addition to the way it looks out, I'll, I'll do it. And that's kind of how I figure out. If I can't think of anything else to do, with it is finished. If they, if you have a waterfall painting that's leaning up against the wall at home, you go back to it. In other words, these aren't like sort of seasonal paintings in your life. I mean, you feel like you can go back and do a waterfall and finish a waterfall painting if you saw something that was wrong. Uh, I'd probably be something else. You know, I'd probably take a waterfall painting and make something else out of it. Okay. So how does how did where did these this particular series come from? Uh, that you've been working on what for two well, or three years? Or so? well, yeah, I, before this, I did these paintings. I did these paintings with staircases with them, right? And it kind of came out. Of, and then I started combining all these different, these different images that I've done throughout my life. I kind of combined these into into one painting or one, you know, one image. And that that's where these come from, actually, combining fires and sky, uh, skies together. Uh, whereas. You know, several years ago, I did just a, a series of paintings of four stars, and I did a series of paintings of skies. So now I take the like, get, you know, take like maybe some house paintings that I've done, put together with a milk bubble painting, or put, but I just paint them differently. I understand. Do you have a a sense of your work in some sort of historical context? I mean, in the context of like 
60s painting or in the context of 70s painting or anything in, in that area? I mean, do, you, do you have any sort of larger context of your peers? I don't really. I, mean, I, I never thought of it that way. But, um. So when you're, you're growing up in Oklahoma, and I was and one, of, one of the things that I found interesting about growing up in Texas was that uh, the culture there was so highly disorganized that one, one managed to meet people who did all sorts of different things. In other words, Roman no writers and dancers and painters and all of these different kinds of people. Was there any kind of cultural context like that? You no. know what was it? No, not when I was 20 years old. I didn't, you know, right. You know. So what, what motivates you? You want to come to California? I, you know, I, frankly, I was motivated to come here because I didn't want to embarrass my parents because I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> and so you decided it would be. So if I'm going to go hang out in a pool hall or something. Uh, it would be easier to do it in LA. Yeah. <laughs> I understand <that>. <laughs> 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 but so you, you didn't grow up in sort of, I mean, you didn't have like a lot of friends in, in, in high school and like that. We all sat around and talked about turn. No. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when I moved out here, when I moved out here, I had never heard of Jackson Pollock. But what did you think when you discovered Jackson Pollock? New world. <laughs> My old world, too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, that, that's like when I went to art school. That's the first time I'd ever. Yeah, I, I never even seen anything. Well, I, what I mean is, and, and one of the things that was very peculiar, the first artist whom I ever responded to in a sort of a direct way was Ellsworth Kelly. And I can remember the first Ellsworth Kellys that I saw in New York, and I can remember thinking, oh, these are really great. And then I can remember going back to West Texas and saying, oh, well, of course. Uh -huh. You know, because I'm looking at the same shadows and the same distinctions and everything like that. Uh, this would seem to imply that you found some sort of analogy between sort of the history of abstract painting and the way you all the looks. Yeah, I guess you could, you know, I guess you could look at it that way. I, I, you know, I, I never really thought that. There was nothing I really thought of that was ever conscious of. So, but, but did, uh, what I'm saying, do you think that, that say, a painter like Pollock or, or a painter like Rocco is probably just as pertinent in this issue as is you know sort of giving you permission to articulate a, a vision of the atmosphere. Oh, I, I, yeah, I think basically I think they gave you permission to, to you know they I think I think they had a mission in mind and I think their mission in mind was to establish a a, a concept or a way of, of thinking that whatever you know like whatever you pursue in your work you should just pursue it and and and, and fuck everything else. Oh. Of course. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, I, what I'm actually <laughs> to get back to that, uh, <laughs> uh, what I'm suggesting here is, 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 is something that, that critics and art historians talk about. They talk about formal prescience in which uh, uh, an artist like Pollock will create a, a, a formal situation which subsequent generations over the years invest with content. Uh, in other words, that the form comes first, the content comes, comes okay. second. And, uh, and it seems like to a certain extent you've taken the sort of the early years of, of, of abstract painting and used it as permission to invest it with, with content that's natural to you. Does that make sense? I think that's probably true, yeah. And so these 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 become the, the paintings of content that, that follow. In other words, it's not the same content as Rothko, but it is the content he makes available. Yeah, and, and also, I mean, if it weren't for the if, if, if it weren't for painters like that, people like me would be painting the way they are. Exactly. So there's no question to me about that. So uh, did, did you ever feel bad about being a painter? Uh, yeah, but I like to. You know, I mean, you know, so, you know, the sort of the shame of painting is a big issue in the last thirty years of uh, of our history. Uh, no, it's like only you know, only that like you know, from you know, the context of you know, my parents being disappointed was all. But then when my, when my mother saw my name in Time magazine, everything was okay. Did that make it okay? It That's did. Great. <laughs> Uh, well, what about the shame of being a painter among your peers? Uh, is this no, I never felt that. Never. Because basically, my, all of my friends were artists anyway. 
rough for the most part until you know maybe ten years ago or something. Then I kind of you know started developing friends that were outside of just the art world. This is when you moved out to the. Uh, that was that was time, yeah, right, maybe twenty to fifteen years ago or something. What? How would you conceptualize the consequences of moving to the farm? Uh, you know what? I, I basically, I developed a different way of seeing, uh, and it, it, it largely it largely came through hunting. And, you know, toward through hunting. Yeah, it really did. Because basically, you know, like when you live in a city and you walk around, you're all you're, you're always like you're you're looking and seeing with peripheral vision, more acute than focus. And when you like look for something in the woods and you're watching, you're looking for movement and you're just very focused on what you're looking for. It's narrowed in what you're looking for. Right. So, so what did you hunt out there? Well, anything that <laughs> <in the> moved. <laughs> <laughs> what did you hunt? I mean, did you hunt birds? Uh, paintings. <laughs> That's right, of course. Uh, so it is out of hunting that the shotgun pictures came about? No, they, they didn't really, but basically it was just the fact that I lived uh, in a secluded area where doing something like that uh, didn't bother anybody. You know, uh, you know she couldn't do that here, so, you know. So, I mean, I've always been sort of beguiled by the shotgun paintings as a critic. You often <laughs> wish that you had your 410, man. <laughs> and uh, if you... Uh, well, maybe let me ask you that is uh, that is you know the idea of shooting your paintings is, is uh, obviously an idea that's occurred to many artists in their lives mm -hmm. at one time or another. Mm -hmm. uh, is this an act of anger or is it an no. act of strategy or is it just a? No, it was like, it was part of the whole it was part of the whole idea that I had of like uh, kind of pursuing in, in, in any way I could the idea of looking through seeing through things. Through, seen through something, and that was just like pretty literal. But uh, you know, so was right. so was cutting like uh, you know a section out of the canvas and yes. seeing another one, and so was like when I did these window paintings of looking at the sky and having the sky actually the instead of the window being on the fr the frame, the sky was the frame for the window. So right. it's, so is 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 would, a, would an artist like Fontana or somebody like that have an influence on the, on that work? Well, probably subconsciously, yeah. Subconsciously, yeah. the idea of it. Huh. Uh, do you, uh, actually, I was, I was thinking that you make these in the city now, but these are actually pretty country paintings. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, the, the, in the sense that they aspire to silence. Uh, is, is this, does this just, whereas the waterfall paintings, I think almost necessity are fairly noisy paintings. Yeah. Right. But, uh, uh, what did you bring back with you? Uh, I mean, I have always been able to sort of overcome my instinct to move to the country, and uh, <laughs> so I, 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 you know, I, I, I'm always interested. <laughs> I mean, there are plenty, plenty of paintings to shoot right here in LA, yeah. but uh, <laughs> but. Uh, Aside from hunting, what was the, what was the, I mean, did you move out there just because you were, like everybody else, just sick of LA? No, I was never sick of LA, but you know what I did, I, like, I reached, I reached a point at, at that time where I kind of had lived in the same place and lived the same kind of life, and I thought, man, you know, I, I just, I, I want to, I want to try, I want to try a whole different life, and that's what I did. I just wanted to move someplace that was completely different than any place I'd ever lived, and, uh, to, to see what that's like, and I did. Well, then, then let me propose this to you. It, it, that is, uh, hunting then becomes a way of aestheticizing nature, which it seems to me is fairly boring without anything else to do in it. Uh, well, yeah, hunting would, I mean, basically, you know, what the, I mean, when you're living some, when you're living someplace like that, you know, you know, there, there's not a lot to do. So any kind of like uh, any kind of like like uh, you know go fishing, go hunting, just to, to, I mean that's like going to a bookstore here. You know? Right. A lot. Well, did your friends come and visit you and go mm -hmm. hunting? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, would you come out there? Okay. No. Right. I didn't. Exactly. You don't trust him. Exactly. Um, <laughs> 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 
I just that thought just burst into my head. Was <laughs> uh, so why did you come back? Uh, I just got tired of talking about the weather. That's <laughs> 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 all people talk about. It. I feel like they had So you came back here to paint the weather. <laughs> talk yeah. about other yeah, things. Right. <laughs> that seems like a good solution. It, it, but, so are you like, um, that is, again, one of these issues of formal prescience in the sense that a lot of sort of process theory predates uh, dynamic systems theory, chaos theory. Uh, is, is this something that interests you? I mean, you're interested in this kind of theoretical... Yeah, I mean, I'm interested. I'm interested, interested in it to, to a certain degree, and actually, the influence from like paintings, like the the fire parts, and in, in, in these are are actually more like um, you know when I when I started looking at images like this, I see things on the news on TV like uh, you know apartment fires, I see fires like after the Laker victory, like bonfires, <laughs> stuff like that. So it's actually you know even though like. I, I, I developed an interest in it, I developed like, the idea of, or, or, or the interest in painting fires. I mean, these fires actually came from more industrial kind of I was going to say, these look like fairly, the fairly country skies, but fairly urban fires. Yeah. Uh, they have that nice kind of Disney polluted kind mm -hmm. of atmosphere about them. Uh, do you when you when you're when you're thinking about it, when you're thinking about painting the weather, I mean I'm always interested in, in, in artists that, that sort of balance the sort of nature culture kind of thing. Uh, where's the locus of celebration here? Are we celebrating art? Are we celebrating nature? Well, I, do you, do you, I, I, don't, I don't think you, I don't think you have to choose, you know, one over the other. But it, it, I definitely think, like, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, myself, when when I'm working on these paintings, like, you know, I, I I don't think of those things at all. I just think of what it looks like. You know? And so you're not saying, oh, this is the sky that morning. Juliet left and things like that. <laughs> no, no, they, uh, they, they don't. They're not meant to have this. Uh, I think. I think my, my proposition is is more like this. I think one of, for me at least, one of the reasons that that I'm comfortable with this, having grown up in Texas, is that one's relationship in Texas with nature is extremely problematic. Uh, I mean, in other words, you cannot, if you grow up in West Texas or Oklahoma, the sort of illusion of the of benign nature is absolutely impossible to. Yeah. In other words, you go to nature for danger, not for comfort. But see, I think the same thing is true in urban areas as well. Well, there's that. You know, I think it's exactly the same. When you have all the, uh, you know, you know all, all the pollution from cars and everything else, you know, we get a different kind of. But I, I think what I'm saying is that these, that is, even as these pictures allude to nature. The allusion to nature doesn't confirm anything about nature. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, I, I'm, I'm really sort of interested in, and I don't mean this in a negative way, I actually mean it in a positive way, there is kind of a dead cool that stands between you and these pictures. It's mm -hmm. not like a turner that invites you in. It's I like, think that's true. Yeah, yeah I mean, and in other words, uh, that is, so this would seem to suggest that the pictures are finished when they're other than you are. I mean, when they're when they're like out there. Mm -hmm. Does it? Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, because uh, it's it's not. I mean, I I can. Um... No, I mean, I just, you know, I mean. There, I mean, I don't see paintings that look peculiar to me. I see paintings that either I like or I don't like, and I, you know, but, but I get information from them, or I don't get information from them. And, uh, you know, but I, I just, I don't relate other, I mean, you know, consciously, I don't relate other painting, paintings to my painting, because when I'm looking at paintings of other people, I, I just consider myself in the audience. I mean, just, I'm, I'm just a voyeur. I'm not a voyeur in my studio. You are. Your boy, you're here now, though, with a piece of the wall. Yeah, exactly. How do they look? Yeah. 
Well, that's good as I can think of. <laughs> <laughs> what is it, uh, okay, that is uh, about jamming the fire and, and the sky up together, then, is this is this like a logical consequence of what you start? Uh, I don't know, I think in a way it is, I think. I mean, in a way I think of it as, uh, you know, it, it's a logical consequence, yeah. Do they, do they come up, is, is this a, a, a progression? Uh, what I, I think what, what I mean is that I'm, I, I'm a critic, I was a rationale. Does this happen one day when you lean a fire painting against the sky? No, no, no. <laughs> it didn't. I did, you know, it, it happened, as I mentioned earlier, by just combining different images uh, uh, that I had done of other series of my work. And, uh, it, you know, that happened. Uh, that happened as a result of seeing a catalog of one of my other work or something. I thought, God, this would look, this, this look strange next to this other one or something. In other words, you're looking at your old work and yeah. you're saying, you should, you should do this. So how, how has the whole business then, and I think the, the hardest part of being a grown-up is trying to remember what it used to feel like, uh, or back when we used to feel things. Uh, how has your idea of the vocation changed, Bill? Because these are fairly... Uh, uh, I mean, the, the quality of these, these paintings to me seems to be sort of, as I say, admirably distanced. Uh, you know, do you have an idea, idea how can I, excuse me, I'm being inarticulate. Uh, well, I'll go back to quote. There's a quote, quote by the, uh, Ed Boucher. I was recommending an artist to, to Ed one day, and, and he just sort of shook his head and said, eh, 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 eh. I said, well, well, what, well, what's wrong with it? I mean, this is the, the quality of the work is really outstanding. And Ed says, I don't care about the quality of the work. I care about the quality of the job. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when I ask you, it's like, what's your job? Right. <laughs> Well, and this I, is the work, but yeah. what's the job? You know, I mean, I, I, I just, I think that, you know, like somebody who, somebody who has um, a situation like an artist does, where they, where they, they had kind of pretty much freedom to do pretty much whatever they want to do. Uh, if they have, I, you know, I think it's like all, it's almost inevitable that they get better as they get older if they're using a tool as a craft to try to to, to try to manipulate an image out of it. Right. And I, I just think that um, that's why I look back on my older paintings and I think, God, I don't even know how I could I don't even know how I could have let that out of my studio. <laughs> right. But um, uh, it's like it is the same thing with apologies too. It's, it's like a piano player. I mean to me like a painter like a it's like a piano player. You know, if you quit for six months, man, you realize you realize how, how you know, you know, you realize what you can't do and what you can do because basically it's like it'd be like a piano player trying to give a concert, uh, you know, after not practicing for six months. Right. And it's the same thing trying to make a painting. You have to kind of get back into it and develop, you know, but uh, a kind of hand, a, a kind of hand-eye coordination thing. Right. So have you, have you ever taught? No. Well, I've done guest teaching things, but I never. Right, I was saying that's I end up telling my students all the time the difference between guitar players and <laughs> graduate students in art is that if you tell a guitar player, gee, what you played was really fucked up, uh, the guitar player will go practice. Yeah. The graduate student will say, wow, I was going through that fucked up look. But you're not in that school. I no. don't, uh, I, 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 I've always, uh, no. <laughs> I, 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 I never succumbed to that. It, well, and it is, you, you belong to a real tradition of making crafted objects. Yeah. And, and who are your peers in this? Well, people like the show here in this gallery, I mean, you know, people like Kenny Price, David, I mean, all these people are my group. And all these people are people that I, you know, respect and get information from. And, you know, I use whatever I can use. And, and, the, and the people, the, where, I get, where I get the most information, where, if, in terms of whether they're art, if they have to be artists, where I get the most information is where I have the most respect. So. 
And when you're talking about information, you're talking about... Well, visually something I can use okay. in my own work to make, uh, you know, or, or, or even an attitude, or even a... Stuff you can steal. Yeah. Okay. I understand that. Mm -hmm. Have you, uh, so as so you're in this craft thing, so what's your relation? Do you have any sort of feeling or connection to sort of uh, what we would call sort of lumping in practice in Los Angeles, sort of the basic practice of very young artists here? Do you, do you, do you see much? Or, or, I, don't, I don't see a lot of uh, younger artists, except in, in, you know, they're showing in galleries, uh, around galleries. But, you know, and, 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 you know, they're, the ones I had seen, the ones I, I, I kind of see the most promise for are the ones that um, I, I see that have very un, undeveloped solutions to their work and everything. But I, I, I can see a struggle, and I can see where they're really, you know, they're really trying to do something. They haven't found a solution in a magazine or in an art class or something. They're, they're, you know, they haven't found it. And, yeah, but you could, you, could, you could see that there's an effort they made in looking for something, and those are the ones that I kind of, you know, like have, a, have you know, hope for, and, and think that, you know. So, and so, so do you have, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, that is, is, does your t can you recognize your taste? Uh, you mean in like a, in other works? Yeah, I mean, not really, because a lot of times the work I like has has, has nothing to do with with. What I do, or anything. Yeah. Well, no. I, there's a thing Hemingway used to say: is that everybody in the world has a certain kind of bullshit that they just love. Right. Uh, you know, that it, it, they know that it's bullshit, but they still just love it. I right. mean, do, do you have? Is, is this area exists for you? I mean, you, you recognize when it's telling you something you you, know, you want to hear. <clears throat> I think what I'm asking you is is is. Do you look for consequences of your painting in the work of younger artists? I don't. I don't. I'm not asking you to find it, but you don't no, actually. You don't actually. No, look I don't. For it. No, in actual, in actual, and I mean, you know, if I if I see if, if I see like really really strong, uh, really strong uh, influences in a younger artist or work of any artwork, it kind of like, it kind of makes me uh, have uh, not much, I don't have much of an attention span for it. I just, you know, I get, you know <laughs> you, you don't. I've already seen it. This, right. You know, just, uh, <clears throat> yeah. And I think if I see the same thing, I might have to feel the same way. So you want to make sort of enclosed, generic work, I mean, this is your work, and, and you don't regard, I mean, you know, obviously you're part of a sort of I guess, I guess you could call this life the space. So it's, uh, I mean, it's a, a part yeah, of the yeah. sort of generational sure. practice. Right. Uh, is it, how has it turned out? Um, people, people ask me this all the time, and I, I give a variety of answers. But uh, but you embark on a practice when you're a kid, and you, you, know, you, you escape from. Oklahoma, so you can go to Blue Falls, and then we're sitting in Venice uh, talking about these pictures that are telling us to shut up. And uh, so, in, in your view, you know, how has it turned out? Is, is it just an occasion to go back in the studio? Uh, yeah, pretty much it is, because uh, it, it's, you know, it, it, it's kind of like growing old. It happens, you know, it, it just happens so gradually, you don't even, you don't notice the difference. I mean, you don't feel the difference. Gee, I do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's really easy to tell, like, no drugs. <laughs> well, what I, okay, here's is that an artist, as you know, if you know artists over the years, you, you have a peer group, right. but then your, your work creates a peer group yeah. subsequently. So, I mean, do you, do you have regard for that? I mean, are there. Are well, that there, starts in art school. I mean, I guess it starts in high school. With, you know, whoever you run around with, but, you know, or grade school even, but, I mean, the, the peer groups are, you know, particularly, like, in the art world, peer groups are almost inevitably people of your own generation, and, uh, uh, and you're happy with that. Well, I don't think it, I don't think it's a thing to be happy or unhappy about it. I think it's just, you know, that, that's kind of who, I mean, you kind of, 
you're kind of thrown into this lot. I mean, when I when I uh, first started having shows, I would go, you know, and I first going to start going to exhibitions. I would go there to eat and drink. Right. You know. That's well, and I know I used to come home with crab claws in the pockets. There you go. Right. Yeah. And that, but then, you know, like after doing it for forty years, uh, you know, <laughs> and you see this, you see the same artist three, three or four times a month every, you know, every every like for twenty five or thirty, forty years. Uh, it's kind of like an extended family. It's just like, you know. That's it. Yeah. You know? Exactly. Well, let me uh, let me open up this, Peter, for questions here. I think John and I have circled around the same duck here for a while. <laughs> yes. Oh, just a second. Somebody's about to give you a microphone here. <clears throat> this is just like Oprah. Sorry. Sorry. You work with color studies. Like, do you color study that you that you're doing these paintings? No. So, but it occurs to me when I was talking before that, that uh, Joe's pictures always look like the school colors of minor colleges. <laughs> uh, but uh, it seems that the, that is. Are you consciously trying to not do some kinds of colors? That's what I mean. No, I don't. I don't have any. I'm not prejudiced against colors. You're not prejudiced against any particular kind of color. Mm -hmm. okay. No, they just try to get the one that worked best. Oh, okay. These were great. Yeah, do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, I'll give you my reaction. Pardon me? I want to give you my reaction to this interview. My reaction? I want to hear my reaction. Oh, I'd like to hear it. I'd like to hear your reaction to my reaction. I'd like to hear your reaction. <laughs> I thought he was terrific in trying to figure out get you to say your paradigm and say how to see. And I heard back every time uh, I'm the artist and I just tell you what I see. And he couldn't get you to frame yourself. And I wanted you to frame yourself. But you wouldn't. You're saying something about just I have an intuitive creativity. I do what I see. And, uh, and I won't define myself any further than that. I think that's uh, the way I feel. I don't have any kind of uh, preconceptions about having, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I think that I'm, I'm, I'm in a situation where I, I have been very lucky to do what I want to do, and um, it's other people who judge it. I don't judge it. so. It is, though, Joe. I mean, it actually, we'll get there. Somebody bring good. It is, though, very peculiar to do unaffectionate nature paintings. Oh, yeah. in, in the in the in the in the American tradition of, of painting nature as you know the word God uh, writ in nature. Mm -hmm. um, it but is. That doesn't mean I don't see the the thing is I you know there, you know I feel affectionate about it. Right, but. Well, I feel affectionate about my name. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 I feel affectionate about nature as soon as I'm out of Texas. <laughs> uh, yes. yes. We're just filling the thing. Yeah. This could work, it work. I, it's amazing how people, I guess that's what's great about art or conversation, how different people react. But uh, I love this interview because you kept making the point that. And I was curious as to when you knew this was the point of your life, was that you wanted to go where no one had gone before, you continued to come back to what you were doing is presenting something that you've never seen before, always looking for something you've never seen before. That really struck me because I had an artist friend once who was down in the doldrums and he was talking about how he wasn't painting because it had all been done. This guy is so brilliant. I love his work, I love what he says, and I love his mind. And one day I was in the uh, rotunda in Italy, Palladio. Such a beautiful place, I said, God, I start to see what this guy was saying. Must have been tough at that point in history where people had gotten very, very good at painting, reproducing things that were familiar, figurative painting. And this guy, of course, was an abstract painter. Mm -hmm. And so when I heard you talk tonight, it sort of was 
another one of those things that was as meaningful as the conversations I had not understood from him until I saw the rotunda. And I said, hey, I can see where it could be tough for an artist when so much has been done before. And if you get stuck feeling you're not doing something new, it must be a difficult thing. So I guess this is a comment in reaction to the other comments to say I personally found your, your comments to be pretty profound in terms of, as an observer of art, the search for truth that I'm looking for in life and in art that you're presenting. And also to ask you, when did you figure out that's what it was all about for you? Mm. If, you can, if you can figure that out. Well, I'm, not, I'm not so sure I'm aware of when, when I first uh, uh, thought of something like that. But, but two thoughts I have in regard to what you have to say. To me, there's two different kinds of painters, essentially. And there's a kind of painter who will paint to show what he can do. And there's another kind of painter who will paint to show you what he sees. There's two different kind of painters. And then the other thing regarding like, uh, you know, what, what I would like to, uh, uh, you know, when, when I was aware of something like that, uh, you know, I just was, I wasn't really conscious of it. I was never really conscious of when it happened. So. But the, there is love in Joe, in which you're still painting the log, drawing the log. Yeah, to me. Uh, I mean, every day this guy is different, and every day hopefully you get better at it. Well, I, I also, I, I mean, I tell people, I, I've told people before, and I feel the same way. You know, I feel like I'm painting the same painting over and over and over again. I'm just, because basically I'm just looking for a way to see something. And so, for me, it's, a, it's, it's you know, one painting is, in, in a sense, uh, more revealing or less revealing for me than other paintings, but it's essentially the same process, you know. And uh, and the other thing is regarding what you, you said when you're talking about your friend, you know, I've, I've also told people who have asked me, you know, like particularly young people when they first, when they, when they are dying to have a show, to have their first show, and I always try to remind them that the first show you have will be the easiest fucking show you'll ever have in your life. And they say, why is that? And I say, you've had a lifetime to prepare it. And the second show you have has to be better than the first show. And you only have six months, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that's it. I mean, essentially, that's it. It gets harder every time. It gets harder for me every time. Well, I would actually, and I, I think there is an end that is when you were talking about, you know, your, your dad having you drawing that log and then you ended up painting the skies. This is, uh, reminded me of Richard Feigenbaum, who's the father of chaos theory, who would, who would walk out one day out up in Los Alamos and realize that for hundreds and hundreds of years, everybody had been looking at the land. And he said, gee, we've never figured out about the clouds before. What I mean is that this is a real generational shift that takes place between you and your dad, that takes mm -hmm. place between two generations. Uh, you know, thousands of, of the nature lovers for hundreds of years before Feigenbaum go out in nature and just ignore the clouds because they have their little hammer and their little thing and they're going to dig down and, and, and discover the geological truth of the drop log. And so uh, so I think that there are there there are some sort of historical temperamental there's a historical temperamental atmosphere. Uh, that's not uh, that's a bad word that has to do with music uh, you know with looking at these sides of open systems. Mm -hmm. Any uh, other questions? Yes. Uh, you may have partially answered the question on that. Uh, I was thinking of a piece that you wrote, um, Art in a Place Like Santa Barbara, right. and that societal wish for an anxiety-free existence. And, uh, it takes a lot to make me anxious these days, so I was wondering, do these pieces fit or not fit into that anxiety-free wish? Well, actually, as as uh, as anxiety causing paintings, uh, Joe's pictures have always made me a little bit anxious. Beginning with the uh, with the milk bottles, uh, <laughs> but I, I, and I think that's what I was trying to say about them is that uh, to present you with the images which are, are not pictures of nature, but that reference nature in such a way that you, as a viewer, have no projective access to it, that basically say, this is nature, here you are, this is something different, this is other than you. Yeah, I think, I find these pictures a little bit nervous making. Uh, in other words, they, you, you, don't, you can't cuddle up to them. 
<laughs> and uh, and there are very few pictures that reference nature in the way that these do that you can't come up to. So uh, I think just in, in, in their refusal to be nice nature, uh, I find them to be sort of, you know, admirably therapeutic in that regard. Yes? I saw these when I sat down here as entering the chat of having very spiritual nature to them. I was wondering what your spiritual inspiration was for these besides your hunting nature. Is there anything more you could say about that? Well, I mean, again, I mean, that's an observation as an audience, and that's what you see in it. So what you see is what you are. I mean, uh, I think what you see in it, is, I mean, it's what you bring to it. And I think that, you know, I think, you know, was I thinking that? No. I mean, I wasn't thinking of it. I, you know, I was thinking of, um, you know, I was just thinking of wet paint and dry paint, to tell you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that there's an there's an inference here of what you might call the cult sublime, uh, which is an idea of sort of otherness of sublimity without any, without any heat. Uh, I mean, without this without sort of the the arch that's usually associated with sublime painting, like Turner. Uh, I would like to add another question, but like uh, Jean Paul sort of imagination. I'm seeing the painter. From this standpoint, I can say what I see at the moment. Yeah, I see the painter inside his painting, and inside his clay, that fire that is behind him. And so I was wondering uh, how, talking about your job, how um, you work, and trying to understand, you know, what these paintings really. These are paintings. These are not nature for me. And they, are, they seem to me a sort of homage to nature, but from inside. Do you paint, paint do, you, do you always paint stay in your studio inside? Mm -hmm. You never I paint do. outside? Never. Never, never, never. Because this seems to me that can make a huge difference. But I have pretty good light in my studio, so. Excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to buy it, of course. But the way you ground <coughs> nature, you talk to nature that comes back in your paintings, is from an inside in which nature and human nature and history and time are not separate. So I was just looking at you like the hunter inside your studio, hunting for the painting through the colors and throwing water on the plane. <laughs> and I would tell you, okay, he's throwing water on the plane, but this is his own plane. His art, his need to do art, and what comes out, who cares? I mean, it is what he cares at the moment. I don't think there is any possible explanation. You know, I was remembering something, a very nice page I read recently, written by Picasso, when he says, Hey, my God, everybody is trying to explain painting, but painting is like the rain that falls down, it's like a uh, bird singing on the tree. And uh, you know, there is no explanation. Somebody is trying to. Gerstenstein was trying to interpret this painting, telling, oh, hey, I can see a conflict between this and this. And he thought, uh, it's a still life. Mm. You know, it's, <laughs> it's really hard to tell. Thank you. Are there any questions? I'd like to um, thank you all for being here today. Elizabeth Beast, who worked so hard the last eight days to get you here.